Afternoon everyone, welcome to Tempest Psychology. Uh, today is Friday the 21st of January and today we're going over some new data that's been released by um, the Office of National Statistics in the UK uh, to do with um, COVID-19 related deaths where COVID-19 was the cause of death rather than when COVID-19 was reported on the just reported on the death certificate. Um, so I've got my screen linked here so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, this will not be a political post at all. Um, I'll only, I'll be providing my insight as a scientist into uh, like some of the problems there might be with this data, my interpretations of the data and so on. But I won't be commenting on government strategies and I won't be uh, given any medical advice or anything like that. Um, my background is psychology and mental health. Uh, I've been trained in epidemiology, so I know how to interpret this sort of thing. But um, as far as anything physiological goes or anything to do with virology, that's completely out of my wheelhouse. Um, so I'm just going to be focusing on what I do know. <laughs> um, okay, so according to the .gov.uk website, um, as of the end of Q3 in 2021, uh, we had about 126,000 deaths in England and Wales um, due to COVID-19. Um, and then in, in this um, data that's been released by the ONS, um, for England and Wales, we find that the deaths are actually 181,000. The reason why my deaths here are, are, are higher is because we're looking at care homes and also deaths in the home, whereas the .gov.uk data is just from NHS England and just looks at uh, deaths at hospital. Okay, so that out of the way, um, what have we got here? Uh, we have the number of deaths in total in England and Wales due to COVID-19 um, for each of these quarters. So we've got all of 2020, um, and then we've got Q1, Q2, and Q3 in 2021. Um, that gives us a total of 204,869 deaths across all age groups. And of those, only 26,771 uh, had no pre-existing condition. I say only, uh, just completely in the sense that um, that's 13.1% of the total population of the deaths. Um, you know, I'm not, you know, did, every single death is obviously a tragedy. Um, but also I just kind of want to give some perspective on this really. So what I've also done is, so here we've got the deaths of everybody across all age groups and then here we've got the deaths of just the 65 plus age group and in the 65 plus age group the deaths where there was no pre-existing condition only made up 11.8 percent of um, of the total and the 65 plus age group made up 88.7 percent of the total covid deaths compared there and there and um 80% of the deaths without pre-existing conditions. So that meant that 20% of the deaths for pre, if you had no pre-existing conditions were people under 65 um, and any other 11.3% uh, of deaths here were um, people 64 and under as well. Um, so you can see that age is probably the biggest contributory factor plus pre-existing condition to um, uh, your chances of survival from COVID-19. Um, but what can we say from this data? Uh, there are some um, issues I think that should be raised about the data set. Um, for one thing, we don't know the, you know, there's no granularity for the age groups. Um, we're, we're only getting uh, you know, just two broad age groups of 0 to 64 uh, of non-neonatal deaths and uh, from 65 plus and what some other data has seen there are other papers out there which show how as you get older past 65 your um, your likelihood of dying from COVID-19 goes up exponentially um, so you could expect that here in this 21,000 people 21,500 people that uh, that's probably um, uh, loaded towards the upper end of uh, of the age groups. Um, so in terms of when it says no pre-existing conditions, 
what would be my problem with that? I think a lot of this data, I think that the issue with it is that we have to take a lot of it with a pinch of salt. Um, a very big, hefty pinch of salt, actually. Because we don't, we still don't know how these people died. Um, these 21,500 people, where they had no pre-existing conditions, but COVID-19 was linked to them, to their deaths. Uh, you know, how, how do we know that the COVID-19 actually caused the death? Um, well, for that, we can actually go to look at the examples of death certificates, and we can look at the ICD-10 classification. So, first of all, what do they mean by a death from COVID or due to COVID and a death related to COVID? You know, this whole pandemic, that's what everybody's been arguing about. You know, how under or overestimated are these death rates? And now we're actually starting to get more of a clear picture. And bearing in mind, we only know about this because of a freedom of, freedom of information request that someone made to the um, Office of National Statistics. So here we have three uh, examples of death certificates where COVID is is uh, on the death certificate. Complete example, you know, they're just, they're just fictitious examples. They're not people's actual death certificates. And um, I th believe this comes from a, a Scottish NHS trust. Yeah, somewhere near Edinburgh. Um, I just found this by a quick Google. Uh, pretty easy to find. So... Again, I'm not a physician, so I had to really read up a lot about this to actually make head or tails of it. Um, I've never filled out a death certificate before, and in fact, I've never seen one. Um, so this was all new to me. So if I have got any of this wrong, and you're a physician, or you fill out these um, these death certificates, or you code for them, just let me know. Um, and, and put me straight, please. I'd appreciate that. Um, so here, then. Uh, where it says disease or condition directly related to the death. And the example is multi-organ failure. And you've got the antecedent causes. So here we would have pandemic COVID-19 disease, you know, in, in section C here. Um, that means that the death is due to COVID-19. So it's due to the multi-organ failure, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and pandemic COVID-19 disease. And um, that's just one example of the way the doctors can write that in. Um, and you see in the second example, they've written it SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, so in terms of the cause of death was myocardial infarction um, and an antecedent cause of the ischemic heart disease. At the time, they were diagnosed as having SARS-CoV-2 and hypertension. Um, so this would be a case of COVID, but the, the death and the death was related to COVID, but it's not in the statistics of being due to COVID. So in the statistics I showed you a minute ago, this particular case wouldn't be included in that. And then you've got the third example. This is where the water's got a bit muddy to me. Um, I don't think this happens that often. Um, so I'm not sure if it actually have a meaningful um, impact on the statistics. But here they've put the disease or condition directly leading to the death, presumed COVID-19 disease. And as you can see here, this is more relevant for community or, G or deaths at a GP service. In, in the UK, well, in the US, you would call that the primary care service, I think you know, the primary care doctors. Um, this person had comorbidities of alcoholic liver cirrhosis and COPD. And so this person would probably be put down as having one or two pre-existing conditions in that data set that I showed you. And then their death was due to COVID. And then up here with this myocardial infarction person, they had one, um, uh, one pre-existing condition, which would be the heart disease, but the death was not due to COVID, so they wouldn't be included. And this person here in the first example, um, they would go down as dying due to COVID, um, even though the primary reason was multi-organ failure. But, you know, the COVID-19 was the uh, contributing factor to the death. And they had, would that be one or two, perhaps two, um, uh, pre-existing conditions of COPD and chronic kidney disease. Um, so that's, and then when, so the ONS, the, the issue that I have with this part of it is how the data is then collected. So obviously what the doctor's doing here are probably fine. Um, one query I would have with this first bit, with the actual recording on the death certificate, 
would be we don't actually know yet are all doctors filling it out consistently um some doctors may interpret differently and if they do how many of them interpret different interpret it differently and does that have a meaningful impact on the statistics um and that's the most important point here with anything i say does it have a meaningful impact um you know because if it's only like five doctors or five cases where it's incorrectly written that's not going to change the, the the bigger picture um but if you've got 2000 doctors all doing it differently um it might have a huge impact and we don't know the answer to that question is what i'm saying um so the next the second problem with this well, that could be a problem anyway is that this death certificate is then handed over to um sent electronically to the office of national statistics and then um people there i believe um code uh, they, they they code the data into a database so if something is um somebody's diagnosed with covid19 or suspected of having it that gets coded in a certain way into the system into the database which i'll go into in a minute and we then have to rely on these coders are they interpreting the death certificates properly so where there's the antecedent causes and the other significant conditions are they being coded appropriately as you know due to covid-19 if it's in the antecedent causes or the direct condition directly leading to death or if it's uh, other significant conditions is it appropriately being coded as um related uh, death related to covid but not caused by covid so then not to be included in the statistics you know again we we don't know that as members of the public as external observers we don't know if that's being done appropriately um it probably is you know i'm not going for anyone's job here i'm not criticizing anybody's job i'm just simply saying we don't know um it would need to be investigated by a research team um and then following that are the people that are uh collating the data set and doing these um analyses are they then doing those anal analyses appropriately um which is probably i think that where my experience comes in it, in in one of my previous jobs is that when I was working as a health analyst that's what I would do I would access the database and I would analyze the data um the chance of error is actually quite low um in these jobs um because you have people checking your work all the time um because there's all sorts of legal, legal ramifications if you get it wrong um and the chance of government involvement at that point is very low um it would be very I think cuz places like the ONS and NHS England um so I'm going off on a bit of a tangent here but uh, places like the ONS and NHS England NHS digital um they do have government directives that they have to follow and public health england do as well but the actual impact that those government directives can have is is very minimal and it's it's very much data based um you know based on the data and uh it, but it is up to the government then how they interpret those findings and what they do about them in terms of what policies they implement. Okay, so on to the next bit which is how do the coders actually take the data from these death certificates and how do they code them into the database? Um they use the ICD-10, the International Classification of Diseases version 10, and there is actually guidance on which codes to use. So here we have uh covid-19 coding in the ICD-10 um my first issue here just cuz it jumps out at you was that this document was written on the 25th of March 2020 and i don't really think it's changed in a meaningful manner since then there have been other updates since but none that actually can uh uh cover the virus identified and not identified codes and i think this might be one of the problems with um the data quality uh is well, I keep saying problems I mean it's a query I would have about the data that needs to be investigated so the coders would put it in as U07.1 or U07.2 and that depends on whether um the patient has been tested for the virus it with uh in a laboratory and it being returned as saying that you've got the virus and the 7.2 would be 
if it's probably if you're if they think you've probably got the virus or you're suspected to have the virus and that is um it's quite a nice nuance to have in the coding um i'm not sure i agree with the fact that they're both lumped under the same code so you wouldn't actually if you see a u07.2 code on the death certificate sorry in the database you wouldn't know um just how what kind of, of a diagnosis there is i think they would need there should be more granularity in that to be honest because um, otherwise the only way we can find out this information now is by going through 204,000 death certificates which is pretty unfeasible um, unless you're doing PhD research or something and have the time to do that okay so how are they saying that you should be coded uh, how, how are they saying that these should be coded for so a confirmed case could be that you have no symptoms but you get a positive test result from the lab test um, and in all three, and then if you have symptoms, they could have COVID-19 documented as the cause of death. So 7.1 is the a virus identified. And then your way of identifying the virus is that it was documented as the cause of death. Now, what I don't know is, does that need to be tested for first? Or is that just, you know, the, the doctor or the physician thinks that you've got COVID-19 and that contributed to your death and then they write that down um surely they would need uh, i would have thought they'd need a lab test to confirm um because it doesn't make sense otherwise but just because it doesn't make sense doesn't mean it's not true <laughs> so yeah i think that's something that would be need to be confirmed by somebody in the in the frontline work really so this is where i'd have another query um because like I say, a lot of this I can't really comment on because I'm not involved in frontline care. Um, and I don't want to risk saying the wrong thing. Um, because I wouldn't want to give people incorrect information. Um, but one qu query I certainly have here is about confirm what is a confirmed case. So a confirmed case is a person with the laboratory confirmation of infection, irrespective of their clinical signs and symptoms. So a symptom is something that a patient experiences and then you report it to the physician and a clinical sign is something that's typically done through a test. So if you think, say, for example, overactive bladder, where your bladder constantly feels like you need to wee, say, every 20 minutes, you know, you might go in to the hospital and they'll do a test on you where they test the pressure inside your bladder and they see if your bladder is um, spasming and activating when it shouldn't be basically so that would be a clinical sign um, so the only way that you get a confirmed case is through laboratory confirmation of infection however the, the, this is where the query lies is because the PCR tests and the lateral flow tests are very unreliable um, some estimates have put it to about a 4 in 10 false positive rate or a false negative rate um and even the the inventor of the pci who sadly passed away a few years ago but um you know he was saying that the pcr cannot be used as a diagnostic tool because it is so sensitive and it's such a powerful tool um it, it just can't be used for diagnostic testing because even if there was a sm very small viral load that's having no effect on the organism it could detect it um even if it's not going to be spread to other people um because the viral is too small and um yeah it's i i think that in the issue with this is because if you're working on a disease that uh has a that the only tests have a low efficacy and a low reliability a low specificity then you've got to think you need other ways of testing for it um, you know, there's plenty of other diseases where we don't rely on one test because the tests aren't strong enough on their own. You, you have to have a battery of tests to figure out if the person does suffer from that particular thing. So, yeah, so that would, but a confirmed case would be a 0.7.1 um, and they've confirmed as having COVID-19. Um, and in which case they, you know, that's... It, from looking at this data and looking at the way this is worded, it would seem that would increase the likelihood that your death would be due to COVID-19 as recorded. 
rather than in reality. Um, okay, and then we move on to suspected and probable cases. So this is like a, a sliding scale of how likely you are to have COVID-19. And again, these can go on your death certificate that you, well, say can, I should be a bit more careful with my wording. They, there's the potential that these could be put down on your death certificate as, uh, as dying due to COVID-19. Um, so you could have, you could be a patient with acute respiratory illness. So you could have fever and at least one sign or symptom of respiratory disease and with no other etiology that fully explains the clinical presentation. So that would rule out things like the cold or the flu, I imagine. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, please. Um, and a history of traveling or residence in a country that has reported local transmission of COVID-19 uh, during the 14 days prior to symptom onset. See, this is where this is also where the outdated nature of this document comes into play because well, it's a pandemic, it's everywhere. You know, there's very few places left in the world, you probably count them on one hand, that, that don't have local transmission of COVID-19 right now. Um, yeah, so, you know, so you could be a suspected case of COVID-19 and have that on your certificate. Be a patient with any acute respiratory illness and if you've been in contact with a confirmed case or probable case of COVID-19. So again, this word probable, which we'll go on to in a minute. So if I got a confirmed case of COVID-19 and then someone I knew who was in contact with me um, died and was related, suspected to be related to COVID-19, they had acute respiratory illness that killed them, then they could put their, on their death certificate that they died from COVID-19. Again, I've been careful with my words. I'm saying could, probably, maybe. Uh, I don't know for sure because I'm not on frontline care. Um, but thinking through this logically, that's what this is saying to me. Um, and also based on my experience in, in the NHS. Or you could be a patient with severe acute respiratory infection and require hospitalization and who has no other etiology that fully explains the presentation. Okay, that, that, that one makes sense to me. So what is a probable case? So this is probably like the lowest type of maybe you have COVID-19 that you can get is that you're a suspected case but the test was inconclusive so if i had to going back to my example if i had if i was a suspected case myself so if i had got been in contact with somebody with covid19 and then i had a test and then my test was inconclusive i'm a probable case and then you pass and then if i come into contact with you and you die of covid19 and you die of a severe acute respiratory infection rather um, they could write COVID-19 on your death certificate because you're in contact with me who had an inconclusive test. So do you see how the burden of proof seems to be getting lower and lower as we go through this definition document? And I think that that's why um, a lot of journalists, a lot of um, scientists and so on, I think this is why we've had such a tough time trying to figure out what actually is the prevalent rate prevalence rate of COVID-19, of SARS-CoV-2, and what actually is the mortality rate of um, COVID-19, because uh, these these definitions are so shaky. And even if you look at the ICD-10 um, online right now, I mean, obviously this is an old, an old document, but it doesn't seem to have been updated in any meaningful way from, on, on from this. Yes, this is kind of concerning. Uh, yeah, so I just kind of wanted to go over that that information there um i think it's actually we should actually take this as really good news that the mortality rate of people with no pre-existing conditions is so low um i think this is some of the best news that we've had in the last two years um and the fact that of, of the um the stratification of the ages as well really we need to know more detail about the age groups and I really wish that they would record this properly. They can do it because they have the numbers, they, they have it in their database. Um, I don't know why they don't release it like that. Um, maybe they want to keep it simple for people because it's, it's easier to work with the, the data set for the public then. In a disease where age seems to be the most important factor on your chances for survival, um, I really think that we need to see 
uh, better granularity in the age statistics. Um, anyway, yeah, I hope that was interesting for you. Um, and I'm actually quite surprised that this hasn't been picked up by any news outlets. I haven't seen it anywhere. Um, I found about this from Dr. John Campbell uh, from his YouTube video. So my thanks to him for finding this. And he's been the only person I've seen talking about it. So, you know, this data was released over a month ago. And with the, uh, with the news outlets hyper focus on the pandemic right now, um, and their continued obsession with it in light of the Omicron data, um, I'm, yeah, I'm honestly surprised this hasn't been picked up. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that and I hope it was informative. Thank you.